Hello everybody, regular viewers of the channel will know that over the last few months I've been obsessing over Aston Martins. Having owned my DB9 for the best part of half a year, I decided that when it went, I did want another one. And I've spent a lot of time driving a whole bunch of different Astons and trying to make my mind up. Well, I am now delighted to say that I have, I've bought a car, and in today's video, I'm gonna show you what it is. But there are a few catches, and so at the end, you can hopefully tell me whether I've made the right decision or I truly am mad. <laughs> Here it is, my 2009 Aston Martin DBS. And I would understand if a few of you right now are quite confused, because I've looked at the DBS several times, and every time I've said, yes, this is the car that I really want, but also the one that I know I shouldn't buy, because with it being so closely related to the DB9, it will share many of that car's problems, the restricted boot space, the useless back seats, and it is ultimately just about the same car, isn't it? Well, over the next few weeks, you're gonna see me eating quite a bit of humble pie, but there is quite the story attached to this car. You see, I genuinely wasn't set on getting a DBS at all because I believed what I said. I wanted one of these, I lusted after one of these, but at 70 to 80,000 pounds or more, depending on spec, it would be more than twice the price of the DB9 and that I just couldn't justify. However, what you're looking at here isn't just any old Aston Martin DBS. This is the cheapest Aston Martin DBS I've ever seen for sale that isn't already on fire or a previous write-off. Even so, I was set on not getting a DBS. Yes, I lust after them, who wouldn't? But my head said, James, you've driven them, you didn't love it, don't do it, you'll be miserable, you'll regret it, and you've got to be sensible, buy something that's less money than the DB9 so you can have it cash, and next year I have to free up some funds anyway, so whatever I buy this year is going, like the DB9, to be a temporary resident. And just to complicate things further, I had actually found just a car and I'd agreed to buy it, but of course I had to sell the DB9 first. I still have a buyer for that car, it is still technically sold, but the paintwork has been taking a little longer than we had hoped. It was in a worse state than I had feared and Bamford Rose want to get it absolutely right. The hope was that I was gonna be able to reveal that car to you first and then something else. So I was all fine, dandy and happy and I knew the car I was going to buy. And then somebody I knew offered me the option to buy a Ferrari. And though I certainly don't need a fourth Ferrari, like I didn't need a third, second or first, it was a good car that I knew at a very tempting price. And I thought there was an opportunity here to do the same thing that I'd done with the DB9. Get a car in, make some content on it, and then hopefully sell it to one of you as your first Ferrari. I really, really enjoyed the process with the DB9. It is clear to me now with the audience that I have, there are lots of people out there interested in buying the cars that I've got. and. 
I don't need to make money on the cars, I can make the money through the videos, so everybody gets a good deal. It's a win, 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 win. However, in spite of what some of you might think, YouTubers are not of unlimited funds, and having already done a deal on another car, if I wanted to buy this Ferrari, I was going to have to finance it. And right on cue, I was approached by a company called Lily & Stanley, a finance firm that said, James, we like your channel, we want to get our name out there a little bit more, do you think you could help perhaps? And I said, well, yes, maybe, but the thing with finance, it's kind of like insurance. You don't really know if it's any good unless you've used it. So I said, um, I tell you what, actually, I am thinking of buying a car. Maybe you can quote me and see if you can do better than my existing finance quotation. And they could, and they were lovely to deal with. And that is why the eagle eye of you might have noticed the Lillian Stanley branding now appearing on the channel, because I am happy to say they have come on board as a sponsor. So I did the deal on this Ferrari, and then at the last minute, the seller got cold feet, decided that maybe he wasn't asking enough for the car, which is fine, and he's right in everything, but I really wished he'd done that a sort of month earlier when I hadn't done a finance application. So that all fell apart and I was sat there rather frustrated. So I did what any sensible car obsessed human being would do and I went back onto Auto Trader having a look to see if there was anything else out there that piqued my interest. And I was browsing through all sorts of stuff, Porsches, Ferraris, Vauxhalls, Volkswagens, you name it. I cast the net far and wide. And I just put in, as I often do, Aston Martin DBS. And this cropped up at 49995 about £10,000 cheaper than I had ever seen a DBS up for sale. And I thought, well, there's got to be something wrong with it, hasn't there? I mean, from the photos, you could see there were a few issues. One of the headlights was quite badly cracked. The wheels looked like they could have used a little bit of attention and they weren't the right DBS wheels anyway and I thought you know eh, eh, yeah but it was in Norfolk not too far from me so I figured you know what let's go and give this a look the weather was a bit miserable I couldn't film let's pop over there and see it the dealer was called Deer and Motor Company and before I left I did my due diligence checked their reviews and they were mixed shall we say with half the people saying they were absolutely fine wonderful and brilliant and the other half saying they were absolute scum and they wish they'd never ever even bothered but you know what they used car dealers most of them get reviews like that and I figured well the easiest way to find out whether they're good or not is see for myself. There were a couple of things that swung it for me. First off, the mileage wasn't out of the ordinary, 41,000, meaning that um, if the car was otherwise fundamentally good, it was a very, very good price. And this also had the Bang and Olufsen stereo with the pop-up tweeters which in fairness isn't actually masses better than the Alpine Premium one. You get to stand up with these cars, but it adds a nice bit of theater and I'm an audio geek, I like these things. So I hopped in the CTR Vantage, which was on the driveway at the time, headed over, got there, had a quick look at the car. It seemed to be sort of all right. Headlight aside, the condition of the bodywork seemed to be okay. And then something caught my eye. I noticed that the side strake of the car was black. And this is unusual because they only really tend to come in one of two flavors for most Astons, including the DBS, which is either chrome or carbon. I've never seen one in black before. So I said to the guy, what's the deal with that? And he said, oh, well, the car used to be wrapped. It, in fact, previously was bright orange. And at the same time they did that, they also wrapped a lot of the chrome stuff in black. And the orange has obviously been taken off, but the black remains. So I thought, OK, all right, I can see that it's already starting to peel off, but this doesn't bother me. That's something for me to do. Content for the old YouTube. They'd had to uh, take some of the interior apart because car dealers being car dealers it hadn't gone anywhere and the battery had run flat and the first thing the guy sort of said to me really quite confused about this uh, first off he said oh the sat nav screen in it doesn't work and I thought okay well you know that does happen because sometimes people don't realize how they function so to get it down they just grab it and push it and they break all the gears and that's an annoyance but actually the sat nav is rubbish anyway so I'd have half a mind just to get rid of it full stop and he also said he'd paid £70,000 for this car. 
Now, I just don't believe that for two reasons. First off, he's a used car salesman. Ergo, I don't believe anything that he said. If he told me the sky was blue, I'd take it with a pinch of salt. Secondly, if you in the trade paid £70,000 for a wrapped DBS, you're mad. Absolutely mad. Now, this was not a car dealer that specialised in high-end stuff, and I've got a few friends that live in the area, and they tell me it's the sort of dealership that deals mostly in your regular five to 20 grand Fiestas and the like, but every now and again, they'll have at least one nice car in, a McLaren, an R8. When I went there last, there was a Bentley Continental out the front, and evidently, for a little while, he decided he wanted to run around in an Aston Martin DBS. Now, one of the things with all cheap cars is that, generally speaking, they don't come with much history. And one of the real problems I've had with buying an Aston Martin is even main dealers, maybe especially main dealers, it's a struggle to get history for these things. You get the book, you get the stamps and all that, but paperwork, there's very little of. And paperwork tells you a lot about a car. However, this one actually had loads. So I started going through it. Now in the advert, they did say the car had had some new things fitted, including brake discs and pads, and the fronts are new. In case you're wondering, because the DBS is standard fit carbon ceramics, Aston Martin's first, 7,000 quid. It also had had a new differential. Fine, saw the invoice for that. That was about eight and a bit thousand pounds, and I was going through, and then I found another invoice. And this one was for just under 22,000 pounds. Now I've seen some pretty big bills in my time. It comes with the territory when you want to own an exotic like this, but that was a monster. That's double any bill I've ever been given, even for the Ferraris. And I thought, what on earth can this be for? The car's already had thousands spent on it for the differential, the brakes. What could be going on now? It was from a main dealer, JCT 600 in Leeds. So I went through it and I saw on there differential. I just thought that's a little bit weird. The car's already got an invoice for the differential. So I checked the dates. The first one was from 2017 and this one was from 2021. In between the car had only done a few thousand miles, but that didn't make up the whole bill. I then went on the next page and saw there was an invoice for the gearbox too. That was another eight and a bit thousand pounds plus fitting. That's a serious invoice. More than that though, I was kind of concerned. Differential failures on these isn't unheard of, but it's certainly not common. And for any car to go through two differentials in a matter of three or 4,000 miles, that's, that's quite extreme. And I thought, as I'm sure you are now, does that point to an underlying issue? Is there something else wrong with this car that means it's eating diffs? So I spoke to the guy there and said, here, I found these two invoices. Everything else looks pretty good. You can see over the years it's had money spent on it, some of it for good stuff, some of it for silly stuff, but you know, that's normal stuff. What's going on though? Why has the car had two diffs? And he said, I don't know. So I said, okay, fine. Why don't we take it out? Because if the differential is knackered, it should hopefully be fairly apparent. So he said, yeah, sure. We hopped in the car took it out and the first thing he did which I have to say I'll give him credit for we went to the petrol station because naturally him being a car dealer this had a whole thimble full of fuel in it and he filled it well put 30 quid in it that's filling it isn't it if you're a car dealer with super unleaded while he was doing that I was also paying attention to the interior I noticed that the leather up here needed sorting out but that's fine that's a common issue I also observed that it's actually nicer leather in the DBS than in the DB9 it's semi aniline here and the dark headline in this car has also meant that it did feel actually a little more different than I thought that it might have done it has the regular comfort seats which are not the ones that I would want, but trying to find one of these with the buckets is quite difficult. And actually, the Aston buckets, I'm not hugely fond of. I'd rather have these, save the money, and put my own in, which I may well do. Anyway, off we went down the A47 with me now in the driver's seat. And um, the A47 is a dual carriageway. It's very, very boring. So I said to him, look, could we, um, could we find a twisty road with some turns so I can really give that differential a work. And he said, yeah, sure, let's take the back routes back to the dealership. So we went out, I put my foot down and 
The car felt good. I have to say, I was impressed with it. I noted that the suspension didn't feel quite as stiff as I remembered the DBS being, and overall I thought, yeah, this, this seems okay. Now, I like to think I'm not unreasonable, even when it comes to buying and selling cars. So, when we got back to the dealership, I had another look around it, and you could see that there were a few little imperfections here and there, but nothing really stood out to me. The headlight I could see, and when it comes to buying cars like this, problems I can see don't concern me. Those that do are the ones that I can't. And this thing was still gnawing at me. This guy says he's paid 70 grand for it. The previous owner has spent a lot of money on it and sold it, partexed it, whatever. It was bought in the trade mail. And you just wonder, is this one of those cars that's been passed from dealer to dealer? Because every one of them has bought it thinking they've got a bargain and then found out that they haven't. So I said, okay, all right, I'll have the car and if it's as good as it appears to be, 49995 is a very fair price. But I need it inspected. I need it looked at. I need to know if there's something going on, particularly with that differential, because I don't want to go and buy it and then be handed another £22,000 bill. So he said, yeah, sure, fine. You can either take it to your guys or we'll take it to the locals. And I said, well, who would you take it to? They said Stratton Motor Company. And I know Stratton, they're not cheap, but they are an authorized Aston Martin Heritage Center. So I said, yeah, that would probably be okay. They also said that the car needed a service so they could get that done at the same time. And it all sounded sort of fairly positive. I was honestly expecting him to say, no, 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 no inspections, no this, that, and the other. And if he'd said that, I, of course, would have walked away. So he said, yeah, let's get it done. He said, tell you what, actually, if it works for you, we can get it inspected. It is gonna need a service, but rather than booking it for an inspection and then booking it for a service, why don't we just knock you off the cost of a service and you can get it done with your guys? Even better, that way Stratton can look at it and then Bamford can look at it. Two independent sets of eyes and then I will know if there's anything wrong with the car. They even said, we'll give you 12 months warranty. That's 12 months of a warranty that's probably not really going to be worth anything, but it was something. So um, I shook the man's hand and we had a deal. Then just half an hour later, while I was on the way home, he phoned me and he said, James, I've already been onto Stratton to try and get the car booked in for an inspection, but they want 2,000 quid. So um, maybe we should book it in with your guys instead. I said, okay, yeah, that does kind of sound like Stratton. That's an awful lot of money for an inspection, but it is the sort of thing that a company would say that doesn't want to do an inspection because they haven't sold the car, ergo aren't making the profit on it. So that's fine, whatever, thank you for letting me know. And he said, also, I've spoken to JCT to see what's going on with this differential thing. And he said, and I might be misremembering this, but he said, actually, that first invoice, the guy didn't have to defit it. Now, it's an invoice. It wasn't a quote, it was an invoice. And I'm pretty sure that he did, but maybe he had a second hand differential or something fitted. The car was making a noise and basically he decided to live with it until it got to the point where he could no longer live with it. Took it to the main dealer and the main dealer said, the problem is with these things, it's a noise from the rear end, there are transaxles. So the differential and the gearbox are essentially kind of all together. And they replaced one part, it improved the problem, it didn't fix it though. So they had to replace the other, hence the £22,000 bill. So I said, oh, okay. I said, well, tell you what, still happy to have the car. I know I can go and get it inspected as soon as I've picked it up. And if anything really major turns up, they're just gonna take it back anyway. They don't have a choice in the matter. But I want the car, it's a really good price. It seemed to me to be okay. If it was really, really, really that far gone, I would like to think I'd have noticed it on the test drive, but never say never and all that. Um, I said, tell you what, look, you said you were gonna give me the money for a service, so why don't we just call it like near a grand off? So let's call it 49,000 pounds rather than 49,995. And he said, yeah, cool, fine, done. So I went home going, um, crumbs. I've just bought a DBS 
phoned up Lily and Stanley, made sure they could transfer the finance from the Ferrari to this. I figured that they could, uh, and in case you're wondering, I've got it on a higher purchase because I want to own it. I put the £9,000 down, so it's £40,000 to finance, and uh, over a 60-month HP, it worked out at like £860 a month, but my plan is to pay it off early anyway, so I wasn't too worried about things, and the early payment penalty is um, relatively small. It's fine, so that was sorted. But things didn't go so well, though, on collection day. There was a wait of just over two weeks between saying I was gonna buy the car and picking it up. We knew this was going to be the case from the off because the Ferrari had always planned to collect at the end of March. I have money coming in and that was going to pay for the deposit. Same with the Aston. I got a friend called Tom from the channel Project 40 Cars to take me over there in his lovely Porsche KN Turbo S. And when I arrived, I very quickly saw the car was tucked away in a corner, which I thought was fine because it's now sold it shouldn't be out the front and as i got closer to it i saw that it was filthy it looked like it hadn't even been touched since we drove it more than that it was still filled with all the point of sale material that they had and in the boot there was a receipt from screwfix for the owner of the company which uh, i thought was rather poor I mean, you spend £5,000, you expect the car to be clean upon arrival. You certainly expect it when you're spending £50,000. So I was a little bit upset about this. Unfortunately, the people I dealt with previously, including the boss, weren't there on this day. Instead, somebody else was, and I voiced my displeasure. I'll be honest about that. But, you know, whatever, I can clean a car. It's annoying, but, you know, let's get on with it. So we went in, I'd already insured it, and we went to go and transfer the tax over and then it turned out that the v5 they had also wasn't working for whatever reason now there are a lot of reasons why a v5 wouldn't be the right one maybe the car's changed address maybe it's got a new owner there's lots of things going on and if it's a new owner and the car had more than they were saying that is a problem because that does affect the value of a car maybe not by much but it does affect it and when you've bought a car you want it to be everything that it's supposed to be. I had naturally done my car vertical check, which had told me that there wasn't anything majorly wrong with the car, no write-off damage or anything like that, and all seemed to be okay. I did another check as well, just to verify, and that came back and said exactly the same thing. For whatever reason, this V5 wasn't working. And it got to the point where they said, well, you know, we can go down to the post office and do this and do this and do this and do this. And I just said, look guys, this is ridiculous. Please just, sort it out otherwise you know what i was starting to think you haven't cleaned it i'm still wondering about this history this differential issue like am i buying a pup here and when things like that aren't working when simple stuff like that isn't working you start to get cold feet and at that point because i hadn't signed for it that's the easiest point to walk away so i said look you sort this or i am just going to walk I've been here enough times, it's starting to feel a little bit wrong now, I'll just go. Doesn't bother me, I don't need it. Magically, they then found a photocopy of the correct V5, we sorted it, and we went. The first 50 yards I was a little worried, because the car was very, very grumbly, it also only just about started. And as the fuel was effectively non-existent in the tank, I managed to get it down to the Tesco's around the corner, fill it, and then have the worry of, okay, it's got fuel now, will it have enough battery to start? Happily, it did. It then chucked it down. I got it home, took it out the next day and thought, right, you know what? I'm gonna give this car a bit of a thrashing and I'm gonna treat myself. I'm gonna take this on a road that I haven't driven for a long time. You see, one of the good things about this car is that though it's not exactly small, it is quite a bit narrower than the Ferraris, the F12 in particular. And there are roads that I really, really like, but in the F12, ooh, ooh oh, they're, they're scary. This though, oh, I had a lot of fun. I'm sure quite a few of you will have noticed already this car has the automatic gearbox, not the manual that everybody wants me to have. But the fact is the auto box is perfectly good. It's decent, it's nice, it works, it suits the character of the car. When I've had enough of it, you press D and it's a perfectly decent auto box. It's a ZF six speed. It's far better behaved than the F12s around town. Makes a good noise too. In fact, possibly a little bit too much noise. I think the exhaust valve fuse might have been removed from the car because it never quietens itself. I also, um, I've also had to put some CDs in it because the uh, Bluetooth adapter for the DB9 is still in 
the DB9 and as I wanted to enjoy the lovely Bang & Olufsen stereo I, um, I thought I'd better go old school and uh, I'd like your feedback on my choices, maybe you can make some suggestions. Regrettably I don't have the obvious best of bond, what I do have is the Black Keys El Camino, uh, Crossroad the best of Bon Jovi, uh, Return of the Champions by Queen and Paul Rogers and One Way Ticket to Hell by The Darkness been quite enjoying it, it's quite old school, I love it. And um, I do actually like this car a lot. Now at the time of filming, and probably by the time of release, the car won't have been looked at by Bamford Rose. I'm trying to get it in with them as soon as possible. And the plan is, when the DB9 is done, this is going to go in. And I'm really, really hoping they don't come back and tell me something horrendous because I do want to keep this. It's the DB9, right? It's a lovely car, it's great. And to some people, it is a dream car, but it's never been mine. I think they've aged sort of somewhat poorly. The looks just aren't as good as they once were, and I just don't lust after it. This, though, oh my word. I was sat there the other day because I did clean it myself, and I know I didn't do a very good job, and I just stared at it going, Wow, what a car. I have noticed a few other issues. I've noticed where a few little fixes have been done. The aircon also frustratingly now the weather is getting nicer, I noticed doesn't work. Oh, I didn't mention, when I took it out on the test drive, I thought I should probably see just how bad that nav screen was. I pressed the button and the other button and it popped up fine. The chap was very confused. He didn't really know what's going on with it. And uh, he just didn't know how to work it. There are though lots of other weird bits of damage throughout this car that I can't explain. Even the handle to release the steering column for adjustment, that's broken. The little tether for the filler flap, that's broken, that's metal. Don't know how you do that. And I'm sure I'm going to find a few more things like that. But if that's all I find, I'm going to be a very, very happy chappy. Have I made the right decision? Or am I completely mad? Let me know in the comment section down below and as ever, Thank you for watching. There will, of course, be a lot more Aston Martin content coming now, but um, I hope you've been enjoying it because I've been loving making it. And uh, I want to say once again a big thanks to all of you for being a part of the channel, regardless of whether you've been here from day one or this is the first video of mine that you've seen. And uh, anything you want to know about this car, please hop into the comment section, let me know. I shall see you there and I shall see you for the next one. Bye-bye.